رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين The story of Musa alayhi salam is recorded in the Quran more than any other story Allah azza wa jal mentions many many dimensions of that account and you can collect at least over 70 dif- different places where he's mentioned even by name this tells us something this ummah like the prophet will also describe to us وسلم, is very close and has a lot to learn from the history of the, na- the last ummah the israelites and a lot of the mistakes that they made and a lot of the experiences that they had are going to be similar to the experiences that we're going to face and we're going to come close to making the same mistakes that they made so we have to learn lessons from their mistakes so we don't fall into the same traps but today is not about their mistakes. Today is actually about the early encounters of Musa alayhi salam with the Pharaoh. You all know that Musa alayhi salam was appointed as Allah's messenger when he was in exile. And he found a fire up on, a, on top of the mountain. And he went there and Allah azza wa jal all of a sudden spoke to him and charged him with the responsibility of being a messenger and going back to the Pharaoh and challenging him. Even though he was someone convicted and wanted for murder and the fear was that he wasn't even going to be given a trial as soon as he enters the city they're going to kill him uh, there's a lot more to this story that I'll highlight in this khutbah because we have brief time I really wanted to get to a particular couple of ayat in Surah Taha and that's why I want to set some of the background information for those of you who don't know and for those of you that could benefit from at least some of the review of the accounts of Musa alayhi salam so he comes back to Egypt and by Allah's will, he's not only able to come back into Egypt, but safely make it all the way to the most secure building of the time, the Pentagon of the time, the castle. And he gets through security also. And now he's in front of the Pharaoh, face to face. And the, the generals of the Pharaoh are all around him. He is alongside his brother, uh, Harun alayhi salam. And he obviously has traveled across you know, the desert, he's come from Madian all the way, so he looks like he's traveled and he's disheveled. And here is someone who basically looks like they're homeless, standing in front of a king, and they're also convicted of a crime, and they're going to now speak to him. You would imagine that this is going to be a very humbling kind of conversation. You know, honorable king, thank you for making the time to see me. And, you know, there's formalities when you meet royalty, but he actually begins very much by declaring that he's Allah's messenger of the actual king, of the actual master, that you're not in charge, and you better let the Israelites, who you have taken as slaves, who you are mistreating in your population, you better let them go. You better not enslave them and oppress them anymore. So he threatens Fir'aun as soon as he walks in. And Fir'aun is in shock, like, who are you to talk to me this way? And he, this debate begins between the two of them. And this remarkable exchange is captured in Surah Al-Shu'ara, which is not the subject today, but I want to give you some background. That's Surah number 26 and how Fir'aun reacted, and then how Musa responded, and that dialogue that took place, you would imagine anybody else who spoke in that position would be given the death penalty right away. How dare somebody speak to the king that way? Some of us even extrapolated that when the Pharaoh used to walk, when Fir'aun used to walk, people would avoid eye contact with him. Ala fil ard, one of the expressions used for him, like he was high up in the land, also means that he looked up, and he looked down at people. And if somebody made eye contact, they'd get in trouble. Just eye contact and they would get in trouble. That kind of arrogance is what he carried. And here you have Musa challenging him directly. But the summary of it is that Musa alayhi salam, in that incredible debate, by the end of it was able to actually not only defeat Fir'aun in that debate, but also humiliate him in front of his own crowd. His generals, his servants, the inner circle of the king, he's now been humiliated. And he can't, he's threatening that he's going to throw Musa alayhi salam in prison, but he can't. Because if he does, there's going to be even a bigger problem for him politically. If he throws him into prison, the people who are impressed, the generals that are impressed inside the court, will go meet him in prison and continue the conversation. And if they do, there might be an internal revolt against Fir'aun. He can't afford that, so he lets him go. Because of course also, if he throws him into prison or has him executed, it shows that he's weak because he didn't have an answer. You know, if you don't have a response, and you don't know how to shut, shut someone up, silence somebody, then you use force against them. You, you, you silence them by any means necessary. And so that would be a, a demonstration of his own weakness, he can't afford to do it. So what he does, is he allows Musa to go. 
Where I started today in Surah Taha is the message of Musa alayhi salam. Who are you, which God are you talking about? And the, the ayat are so universal. الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ مَهْدَ And the one who made the earth a, you know, a cradle for you, meaning a place to find comfort in for you. This is by the way, in it there's uh, interesting nuances. Fir'aun believed that the earth belongs to him. And the, 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 the land of Egypt was made extremely well irrigated because of the, the river that went through it, and the, the Nile going through it. And actually we know from the story of Yusuf السلام, that there was a drought. And because of that drought, there was the, you know, the entire region was going to be suffering. What a lot of people don't know is back then in the time of uh, Yusuf السلام, there used to be multiple kings, all of them have equal power. And because of the strategy of Yusuf السلام, they actually dug canals and they, they reserved water because the river was going to dry up later on for seven years. And the, this one particular family of kings was the only one that had water left for seven years. Meanwhile, all the other kingdoms became bankrupt. And that's actually slowly how the pharaohs became a unified kingdom in all of Egypt. And the most you know, economically powerful in all of Egypt. It's actually because of the strategy of Yusuf السلام, that over generations, the pharaohs became who they were. Otherwise, they would never have had, they were, there was a power sharing kind of situation. In any case, now he says, you know, وَهَذِهِ الْأَنْهَارُ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِي The pharaoh arrogantly, arrogantly says, don't I own all of the land of Egypt? أَلَيْسَ لِي مُلْكُ مِصْرِ And these rivers flow beneath my feet? I have ownership of these rivers. And look at the commentary of Musa alayhi salam, so subtle. He says, the one who made the earth comfortable for you. And then he says, وَسَلَكَ لَكُمْ فِيهَا سُبُلٌ And he carved out pathways within the earth. Just like Yusuf alayhi salam had carved out waterways actually. Allah is the one who facilitated this for you. Your kingdom didn't come into place because of you. Or because you're entitled. وَأَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً And what would have happened if he didn't sell, send water from the sky? He says, Musa alayhi says, and he's the one who sent water from the sky. فَأَخْرَجْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِنْ نَبَاتٍ شَتَّى So he sent from it all pairs of plants, all kinds of vegetation that grows all over the place in, in diverse fashion. كُلُوا وَرْعَوْ أَنْعَامَكُمْ Eat and feed your cattle also, feed your animals also. In all of that, there are some pretty powerful miraculous signs for people who truly possess sound intellect, who can stop and think. And interestingly enough, in the Arabic language, for the ability to think is related to the ability to stop. Nahi in Arabic is to stop or prevent. And one of the words for intellect in Arabic is people, people of intellect, ulun nuha. Another word for the people of intellect, the hijr. Inna fi dhalika laqasamun. The hijr. Why hijr? Hijr is a rock. Because a rock or a, a boulder prevents, you know, to, for you to go further. You have to go around it. What's the connection between stopping and preventing and the intellect? The thing is, you're presented with all kinds of ideas. What we call today propaganda. And you have to stop and analyze what's being said. You can't just keep consuming information. You have to actually stop and critique and criticize what is being said, why is it being said to me, what game is being played, is there a game being played? Because if you keep on taking in information, you would think you're becoming smarter because you're listening to a lot of news, or you're getting a lot of you know, insights or whatever. You may just be getting a whole lot of confusion in your head and you've never stopped to think about any of it. You just take everything at face value. Musa السلام, says there are signs in it for people who will stop and think. Meaning for people who are not going to apply their intellect, they will be benefit nothing from what I'm saying. Fir'aun sees a very powerful threat here. So he has to, he, and I told you already, he, he's not going to kill him. He's not going to kill him. There's other reasons why he won't kill him also, he also loves him. There's a special love Allah put inside of Fir'aun for Musa السلام, which kept him from killing him for many years actually. And eventually he was convinced of killing him. ذَرُونِي أَقْتُلْ Musa. Finally, let me be, I'll kill Musa myself. But that's at the end. There are many years in between of a struggle between Fir'aun and Musa alayhi salam. Qur'an will describe them literally as sinin. أَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِالسِّنِينَ In any case, what I wanted to share with you is how does Fir'aun then in the meantime deal with the problem of Musa? There are two phases here. In the first phase he says, fine, you've shown us these magic tricks of yours. The staff, the stick that turns into a snake, or this hand that turns white, this, it's nothing but magic. And you know what? I will prove to the nation that this is nothing but magic. And we're going to meet together again, 
But this is going to be Yawm zina the day on which everybody gathers. It's like their Independence Day, even though they're under the Pharaoh. So they probably not, don't call it Independence Day, probably Dependence Day. But you know, whatever that is, the day of festivities they have is when he's, he wants to gather everybody and he wants to do a showdown between Musa and Pharaoh. That's what he's hoping for. But what's remarkable about that also is people were not patriotic. People were not interested in this theater. Nobody wanted to come out. So Qur'an even comments that he forced people to come, to attend. وَقِيلَ لِلنَّاسِ هَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُجْتَمِعُونَ People were told, are you gathering or what? Like soldiers would go door to door and say, hey, you better show up for the parade. And they'd force people to come because it's a totalitarian regime. He's forcing, so it looks like people are patriotic. People are forced to be there, so it looks like they stand together with him. Now in the meantime, and we all know that in that, in, in that time, he, you know, he gathered the best of the magicians, and this was actually supposed to instill fear into Musa alayhi salam. But what I, before I want to get to that, that's actually not the pur purpose of this khutbah today. Here's what it is. Musa alayhi salam, as he continues to spread his message, Fir'aun needs to come up with a counter message. You know, there's messaging and there's counter messaging. And what is the counter message inside of the administration of the Pharaoh? There are lots of experts. Some people are saying, let him be. Some people are saying, execute him right away. Some people are saying, let's call him a liar. Some people are saying, let's call him a murderer. Some people are saying, let's call him a magician. Whatever, there are lots of different opinions on how to deal with the problem of this Islam that has come into the land. And we need to get rid of this threat to our homeland. We need to fix this problem. And they're having their meetings. And so Quran says, فَتَنَازَعُوا أَمْرَهُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ وَأَسَرُّ النَّجْوَىٰ They had lots of disagreements about how to deal with their situation among themselves. And they secretly conspired a great deal. They had a lot of secret hearings to deal with the problem of Islam that was coming to this new land of ours. And so finally they came out with a unified messaging. Because they can't come across as people that have disagreements within themselves. This is important because the Pharaoh at first, he contradicted himself. When he first came into contact with Musa السلام, as a messenger, he would call him a, a liar. He would call him someone who's de denying that he committed a crime. Then he c accused him of being a magician. Like there are multiple phases of what he was saying, or someone who doesn't make any sense. So there are multiple allegations. Compare this to even the Prophet of Allah وسلم. Some people called him a poet, some people called him a magician, some people called him possessed, right? Some people called him someone who secretly has an agenda. Some people said he's learning this stuff from Christians and Jews secretly, etc. People had different allegations. Can they all be true at the same time? No, because they're contradicting each other, aren't they? You can't be insane and a genius at the same time. Or a magician at the same time as someone who's learning from X, Y, Z. They don't add up together. So when they came up with multiple lies, those lies started contradicting each other and the people started questioning, hey, which one is it? And that actually makes the, the, the Prophet looks good, look good. Or makes, makes people more curious about the Prophet. So they had to come up with one line that they're going to stick with. One agenda that they are going to teach everybody. When you go out, this is what you tell people. This is why Musa is bad news. This is why Musa is a problem. And here's what it is. قَالُوا إِنْ هَذَانِ لَسَاحِرَانِ These two, Musa and Harun, they're nothing but magicians, number one. Whatever they have to say is a kind of mind game. Sihar in Arabic is actually a way of deceiving someone. These are people that will, that will uh, get inside your head. They will manipulate you. Don't listen to them. Don't go near them. By the way, this is the same thing that was said about Rasulullah wasallam. If you go near him, just put something in your ear so you don't hear his magic, which is what they refer to the Quran as. Because if you hear it, you're going to get messed up. It's going to mess you up. You're going to go against your family. You're going to leave home. It's going to drive you insane. So save yourself. Now their first propaganda, they're nothing but magicians. But here's the fun part. يُرِيدَانِ أَنْ يُخْرِجَاكُمْ مِنْ أَرْضِكُمْ بِسِحْرِهِمَا Their agenda is to get you, take you away from your land using their magic. They are a threat to the land. This land belongs to us and they want us out of here. They want to dominate us. What are these two men in, in front of a standing army? <laughs> in front of the, one of the greatest kingdoms that ever existed. Standing there with nothing but a message that Allah is the one who sends rain from the sky. Or Allah is the one who made the earth humbled for you. Or Allah is the one who opened up pathways and roadways for you on this land. They're the threat? This is their great threat? 
and one of the greatest military mights in human history is saying, they're going to kick us out of our land or out of your land. And notice, by the way, when he said this, Fir'aun, I've already told you before, when he was in power, he used to openly say, who does the land belong to? Me. It's my land. These rivers flow beneath my feet. This is what he would say openly. But now that he's threatened and his power is about to go away, he says, I, people will not back me up. He, I can't go give a public speech and say, I really want to stay king and I'm scared of Musa. He can't give that kind of a speech and expose his own weakness. So he has to say, hey guys, this is your land. These people and this Islam, this Musa and Harun, they are a threat to your land. He's never said your land before. It was always my land. What happened all of a sudden? Oh, this is about the people. This propaganda is, even though he's an elitist, he believes everything is entitled for himself. He feels himself superior to everyone else. When he gives his political speeches, he makes people feel like, no, no, I'm there for you guys. I'm worried about you. And I want to save this, this nation and I want to make sure it stays great or gets great again. That's what he wants. And that's how he's going to position his speeches. That's the second part. Yuridani and yukhrijakum min ardikum bisihrihima. But my favorite of all parts, wa yadhaba bi tariqatikumul muthla. It's incredible. And he wants to remove from you, get rid of it, from, remove something from you. What, what does he want to get rid of from you? Your exemplary lifestyle. Your way of life is better than everybody else's. And these people, they're against our way of life. Literally, tariqa, the way we live, the style in which we live. By the way, the pharaohs, they were the only ones living well. The vast majority of even the Egyptians and the Israelites were living under hard times. They had economic trouble, they had political trouble, their voices were not heard. The only people benefiting from the land were the elite. And yet they sold people, we have the best lifestyle. So what if you're going bankrupt? So what if there's nobody to take care of your medical needs? So what if you're losing your jobs or barely enough to pay, get paid enough to survive? None of that's important. What's important is Egypt is number one, baby. And we better hold on to this number one status. We're the best. And these people, they're a threat to our number one status. These poor people that were being given this propaganda, what does the Quran say? Istafazza, istakhaffa. He took them for a ride. He made them, he, he, he took their ability to think away. He made them emotionally weak. So they would hear his propaganda and they would get scared. Really? Our lifestyle is going to change? Everything's going to go away? What little I have is also going to be gone? I can't allow that to happen. Wayadhaba bi tariqatikum. But then he used the word al muthla. Muthla comes from the Arabic word amthal. It's the feminine of it. Amthal means that which. That's whose examples are most given. Let me put that in simple words for you. When you come across something, like for example, if you're talking about uh, school, the number one school in the nation, everybody gives its example, right? We want to be like that. I want to go to a university like Harvard. I want a great car like a Mercedes. People give the example of the, the elite thing, the highest thing. The thing whose example is always given, the elite example that's always given, in any space, that's actually the example that's amthal. That's the word that's being used here, the feminine form, al-muthla. In other words, we are so amazing as a nation, when every, anybody thinks of advancement, or justice, or security, or lifestyle, when they think of the very best, they think of us. We are already number one. We don't need any improvement. We're already the very best. There's no better to have than us. How can they bring anything that's going to improve us? We're already perfect. وَيَذْهَبَا بِطَرِيقَتِكُمُ الْمُثْلَى He sold people this artificial patriotism in the name of being the best that needs no improvement whatsoever. And the only one to benefit from this messaging was himself and the people close around him. They were the only people that were going to benefit. And now he had successfully crafted counter-messaging. What is that counter-messaging? On the one hand, there is a man who's just saying we believe in God, and that, that there's only one, of the, one God, and He's the one who sends water from the sky, He's the one who provides, just be grateful to Him. It wasn't even a political message actually. But on the other hand, on the other hand, no, it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter if it doesn't sound threatening. There's a threatening undertone. There's a secret threat to your society in their message. Don't be duped. Stay away from them and be afraid of them. Be afraid of anyone who follows Musa in his way instill an irrational fear in people. And by the way, the only people who are able to see through that irrational fear are people who stop 
and think. لِأُولِ النُّهَا People who were able to stop and actually think. We find ourselves in interesting times and I won't explain to you the obvious why I shared, why I decided to share some things from this khutbah or these ayat with you today. But I do want to share with you what, what comes next. فَأَجْمِعُوا كَيْدَكُمْ Then gather all of your schemes. This is really interesting language. There are multiple departments. There's a security department, there's an intelligence department, there's other departments. I need you all to work together on this. And you need to come up with a united scheme to deal with the problem. ثُمَّأْتُوا صَفًّا Then attack and go on the offensive united. Everybody needs to be on the same page here. We need to align everybody and synchronize everybody to get rid of this problem altogether. وَقَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْيَوْمَ مَنْ اسْتَعْلَى And today the only one who will, you will, who will be successful is the one who is able to show that they are superior. Their purpose, their agenda was to show superiority. Musa alayhi salam comes with actually a message that he himself is a humble slave. That he himself is there to just preach the truth. And on the other hand, the only agenda was to demonstrate superiority. So now when Musa alayhi salam, and this is the part I'll fast forward and only get to one, one conclusion inshallah. And that is, that when finally the day came, this was the propaganda happening before they met, the magicians met with the Pharaoh. Uh, magicians met with Musa alayhi salam. When it all goes down, and in front of the entire crowd that was gathered, all of it collapses. I just want you to think about one thing here. Fir'aun had a military at his disposal. He had basically the propaganda of the entire nation at his disposal. He could control the messaging and unify the messaging, right? And we already talked about you know, how he could gather people, ajmi'u kaidakum, and scheming and secret meetings, all of it, all of these resources are with him. And what everybody's talking about across the land is in his control. He controls the media, the military, the propaganda, all of it. Musa alayhi salam has no financial resources, has no political resources, has no military resources, has no resources. He's simply, all, the only resource he has is the truth. That, that, that's all he has. All he can do is just talk about what Allah told him. That's all. The words of truth. There's nothing else at his disposal. And Fir'aun's scheme is to crush this messaging all together by making a huge spectacle out of it, forcing people to come and getting them to go against each other. And finally, when he's humiliated in public, this Islam thing will die. In other words, he wants, he wants people to see how bad and how, uh, how untrue and what a failure the religion is. And he wants to show that to the public all at one time. When he does this, and I think all of you know the story, it backfires, doesn't it? The magicians who were supposed to be against and demonstrate the greatness of the Pharaoh, وَقَالُوا بِعِزَّةِ فِرْعَوْنِ they actually started their battle with calling on the glory of the Pharaoh. They made it, they tried to make the Pharaoh look good, you know. And when they were overcome, when they fall into sajda, when the greatest threats, the ones that were supposed to be the greatest obstacle to the truth were the ones that were going to undermine the miracle of Allah given to, the, to Musa السلام, the staff in the hand. When those people, the greatest weapon of the Pharaoh, the, the ones at the front of his propaganda machinery, when they fell into sajda, then what, is, what message does that send to the entire nation? And Fir'aun don't, doesn't know how to deal with this now. The whole, he's a magician, and he's gonna get rid of your power, and he's gonna get you kicked out of your land. All of that has failed. And you better believe in our heroes, these magicians, they will save us. He's putting their posters up. But when they take shahada, they fall into sajda, he now has to come up with an immediate alternative scream, you know, scheme. Ah, innahu la kabirukum alladhi allakum Oh, he's he's your ringleader. He's the one who taught you magic to begin with. I see what this is. I see. And I, now, obviously, that isn't true. They trained in different cities, and he brought them min al madaini. You know, al-madaini hashirin. He brought them from all over the place. That obviously isn't true. People can see right through it. But before people even get to question it, I'm going to make an example out of you. I'm going to chop you up from opposite ends, right arm, left leg, and I'm going to hang hang you from the park barks of trees, so people can see what happens when they're you know traitors against me. Now he knows the only thing left is to instill horrible fear in people for anybody who dare question him in any way, shape, or form. 
This is the nature of propaganda. It's always been. There's nothing new. Instilling fear into people. Keeping people from thinking straight. Spinning a story about what believers are and what they represent to a society. Describing them as a threat to the nation. This stuff isn't new. We've always experienced this. This is why it's in the Quran. Allah didn't just tell us stories. He told us to be mentally prepared. He taught us how to be mentally prepared. And by the way, what they had to fear then, the fact that you're feeling afraid, you're not less of a believer if you're feeling nervous and afraid. If because of what's happening around the nation and the rhetoric that's happening and the masajid that are being attacked and you know, the things that are being said on the street or your family has to hear in the mall or whatever's happened with you, or your children at school, in public schools. If you're feeling afraid, that doesn't mean you're, you're less in Iman in some way. The, the bravest of all of these people who faced propaganda and faced corruption was Musa alayhi salam himself. And at one point, فَأَوْجَسَ فِي نَفْسِهِ خِيفَةً Musa. In his own self, he felt fear. Musa also, Allah even says, even Musa. And so it's okay for you to feel afraid. But that's when you come back to Allah's word. And that's what Allah's word will mean something to us. قُلْنَا لَا تَخَفْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْأَعْلَى Don't be afraid. You're the one on top. You're the one very much on top. Don't forget that. Why? Because you're with Allah. And because Allah is with you. وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ You will be on top. You will be superior. You will not have anything to be afraid of so long as you truly believe. This is a test of our iman. If nothing else, this is a test of our iman. Your citizenship is less valuable, your home is less valuable, your, your family's security is less valuable, your finances are less valuable, your iman is more valuable. And if this experience will increase your iman, it's worth it. If it will increase my iman, it's worth it. So let's take these difficult times as an opportunity to really increase our reliance and our iman in Allah. And know that these things, these, these people have come and gone. This kind of propaganda has come and gone. And it's not something that should intimidate you away from your faith. There are going to be people, when they're under this pressure, they're going to hide their iman. They're going to run away from their faith. And think that if they run away from their faith, they're not, this, the problem's going to go away. And here it is Allah Azza wa describing that under the most impossible odds, Allah keeps Musa alayhi salam safe and secure only because of his iman. May Allah Azza wa Jal secure us because of our Iman. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa zikr al-Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al-lazheen astafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatamin nabiyyin Muhammadin al-Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Qala Allahu Azza wa Jal fi kitabihi al-Kareem ba'da an aqula a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-Rajim inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا